Welcome. Today we'll talk about the honeypot that we set up last time and dive into the data that it collected. Analyze it and see if we can find some bots. Are you ready? Let's go. First up, we have to get the data from our honeypot. In order to do that, we need to stop it. So log into DigitalOcean, open your honeypot droplet and toggle the on and off switch in the top right. Once that is done, power it on again. We have to do that because the honeypot blocked SSH access because it took over port 22. So now that it's on again, we should be able to log in uh, via SFTP, for example, or SCP. The easiest way to access it is clicking the console button in the top right. Once we do that, a new window will open and a couple of seconds later, we should have access to the machine. The quick and dirty way to get the data out would be to run a Python web server, download the data and then stop it again immediately. That's what we will do today. Don't do this in production. In production, you would use SFTP or SCP to get the data out, but I forgot the password. The data is located in var log. So let's go there. Our glutton file is here and we can look at that if we want to. Looks good. Wonderful. So now we also can see if we just run ls, we see that the file has been separated into two, into a different entity. If we look at those in detail, we can see that they're all very similarly sized. That means once a log file reaches a certain length, it's automatically cut off and then zipped in order to save space. So in theory, we would need to download all the files in practice as well. Running our Python web server is fairly easy. We just run Python 3, tag m, HTTP server and then specify a port. I'll use 8080. And then in our browser, we would go to the IP address of our machine on the specified port and then download the files. Okay, so let's check the files. I have two of them, uh, one the original one and then one of the GIP, uh, gzip files. In order to unzip it, you can use gunzip with the correct name. The files that have been downloaded come in a certain order. The gzip files are usually older than the, the last one. So what you have to do is to append this file to this file. In order to do that, you can use cat command. You can also look at one of the previous videos where I showed how to use all the different commands in Linux for hackers. I'll link it in the description and also uh, somewhere in the video now. If you use double uh, bigger than signs, that means it will be appended to the file that you specify next. And what we want to do is we want to read line by line the glutton file and append it to the glutton 2023 whatever file. All of them are combined. And there's one last thing that we have to do. So the glutton file looks like this. And the issue that we have is that we have MSG twice. So we have it once here and once here. That's an issue because the seam or any other tool that you want to use later on will say that this field already exists and that's a problem. So what can we do? We can change that. What we're trying to do is an inline replacement. So that means we open the file, find a piece of text and change this text to a new text. We want to find the string handler double quote colon double quote telnet double quote comma msg. That's what we search for and we will replace it with handler telnet and message. And that way we don't have it twice. So if you have not used the Glutton version from the last video, my pull request was approved. So now this is not necessary anymore, but if you downloaded the old version, then you still have to do this. Next up, we will install a Python virtual environment so that we can install libraries that might have different versions from other projects on our computers. And one of the easiest way to do that is using poetry. I'll put the link in the description. If you go to python tag poetry.org and then click on documentation and introduction, there will be an installation section on the left. Click on that, scroll down a little, and then just copy and paste this command into your terminal, run it. I'll pause the recording here and then come back once it's installed. Now, we can use poetry tag type version to see if it was really installed. And yes, we have version 1.3.2. In order to create a new environment, you just use poetry init and then walk through the process. So for us, yes, this project can be called Honeypot. The version is fine, description is fine. And once we're at this stage, we want to define our main dependencies indirectively. Yes, we want to do that. We want Jupyter Lab, and then we want the package at zero. We will use the latest version. Then we also want to install Pandas. We also want the newest version. So click enter. We don't want different development dependencies. And yes, we want to generate that. 
Now we have a pyproject.toml file, which is basically a YAML file, and that contains all the, the data that we just specified. Uh, now the trick is you need to also install it. So you need to do poetry install, and that will set up your local environment. Okay, now everything is installed, and now we can get into the environment with poetry shell. And then we can start our analysis with Jupyter base lab. That will spin up a Jupyter server and then we can load the data. I'll link the repository in the description so that you can just click on it and walk through it. Let me walk you through what I did, how I analyzed the data. First, we import all the libraries, then we open the log file and pass that into a variable. Next, what you can do is to load this into a zine. You can use OpenSearch, you can use ElkStack. They all work the same because the underlying technology is basically Elasticsearch. Uh, they have two APIs. They have the bulk and the individual API, and you just add them using your preferred method. I just left it in here in case you want to do it. Next, we look at the layout of the log file. Um, this is a list containing JSON strings. So what we do with that information is just to check, okay, is everything as we expected? Then once we make sure that it is, we create a new list because pandas, the library, likes to work with lists of dictionaries. And as you might know, JSON objects are basically dictionaries in Python. And we read in the log file line by line and append it to our list of dictionaries. And we convert the string that we found into a JSON object or a dictionary in Python. Next, we create a data frame. A data frame is basically a table that is filled with relational data. So you have columns and you have rows. The important thing here is that Pandas expects each row to have the same column names. That's why we need to use um, our log file from line four onwards because the first three in my case are glutton starting log messages and they have a different format compared to the rest. And then we create a data frame. We check the data frame by using the head method, it typically shows the first five lines. We can specify more within the parentheses, but we don't care about the others for now. We just wanna see that everything is as we expected. So the level is fine. Timestamp was not parsed correctly, but we don't really care about it because we don't yet want to do a temporal analysis. The message is there, sensor ID is there, uh, that is like a unique identifier. The IP is there, it was parsed correctly, and we have some ports. So that looks good. First thing that I thought about was, hmm, what is interesting to me? So for me, the first thing that came to mind is which ports do bots typically attack? And what came out of it was that 23 and 2323 are the most common ports. On our data frame, we want to query the destination port column. That's the one that the bot attacks. We want to count the values. So how often does each uh, port occur? And then show the first uh, 10. It orders them in a descending manner. So first is the one with the most hits and then it uh, becomes gradually lower. So what we can see is that 23 is the most common uh, with 2.4 million out of our 3.4 million hits. So that's roughly 60, between 60 and 70%. Next up is 23.23. I assume that this port basically has the same methodology behind it. So it's similar to the alternative port of SSH, right? So some people use 22, that's the standard, or some people use 22.22 to throw bots off. Um, I think they know by now. Okay, let's go through the list a little more. Next, we have 3399 can be an SAP Enterprise Management Port. So SAP, as you might know, is a software company from Germany that produces a lot of enterprise level software, such as uh, CRM, buying, online shops, etc. And another option could also be that this is targeting Cisco routers because uh, CSMS, which is kind of like the remote um, Cisco router management protocol, is also running on uh, 3399, according to my research. 37215, uh, Huawei routers are using it, and there has been a published exploit for a local file inclusion. Potentially that is targeted. Um, we have 23231, which is 
first of all associated with uh, Mirai botnet and could also be another telnet port right because it's 23 23 and just the one edit could also be one of those and then we have good old lady so all the web applications that typically run uh, unencrypted via http we have 21 good old unencrypted uh, file transfer protocol 8080 which is uh, from experience usually used for web app testing so like local servers running that some software developer forgot to close 8888 similar use case sometimes also used for uh, production environments depending on application but there is no clear technology associated with those and then we have 6379 which is usually used by redis uh, redis is an in-memory database i think from apache um, that can be used as a caching layer or as a really fast uh, key value store in memory there have been a couple of vulnerabilities that have been reported for it is in recent years as well and it might be that this is one of the reasons why they're targeting them my assumption is that they always target easily automatable attacks so that when they get a hit maybe they get a discord message slack message etc in the background and then can focus on the individual servers that they exploited by hand i assume maybe also other scripts are running then i wanted to dive deeper into who's actually targeting my honeypot can we identify the host providers and what we also want to figure out is so who's sending the traffic are they allowed to do it most likely not and can we maybe block them on an ip level or inform the service provider or a server provider so that they shut down the operations of the bots. Um, for that, I looked at the top 10 IPs. Let's look at our number one first and see which ports they usually attack. And we can see that this attacker is responsible for almost one third of all the hits. They are only targeting Telnet and the Telnet alternative port. And then we go through the list. So what does the second one look like? The second one also looks at Telnet and the alternative Telnet port only. The third one as well, so that means our top three attackers are all hitting Telnet only. Now, what would come next? We would want to figure out where are they coming from, who's the hosting provider, and can we drill down on specific companies? What we could see is that most of them are located in uh, Europe, specifically in the Netherlands. And if we go through the list, we can also see that there is a large correlation between specific IPs and companies that host them. I had to use two different IP service providers to check where the IPs are coming from because one of them wasn't able to pin down exactly where the IP ranges originate, but the other one was very specific and could also tell us that for most of them, a company called Desk Capital or Server Ion is behind most of the IPs. Let's look at our number one. Number one is coming from the Netherlands. Uh, I think specifically Amsterdam, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And if we do a reverse IP lookup, so that means we want to find out which DNS records are associated with this IP. We can use dig and tag X for that. We see that there is one name server and powered by crazy.ru, which is a very interesting domain. This name basically caught me off guard and I was like, huh, that does not sound uninteresting first uh what i usually do is figure out how long does the domain exist usually get they get reported pretty fast and that means that they are then shut down this one however has almost been running for a year so it was first registered in i think um may 2022 and now the video is recorded in february 2023 so almost one year we have two different options to look at that number one as far as total that tells us specific information about it if we look at it we can see when the registration happened here so 12th of may 2022 we could also look at relations but for now we don't care um, and then we could also look at third sh so did they have an https uh, certificate and yes they do we can also identify specific subdomains that were live at some point in the past what do we do with this information mm, it doesn't show us too much they are fairly like the domain is fairly old and if we search google for this domain we can see that there are a lot of ip addresses linked to it and also one specific service, it's Noverse, I have no idea what that is, that also mentioned it on its ban list as a known spammer or unauthenticated brute forcer. 
Okay, what do we do with this information? We can now collect all the different IPs and then check which host are they associated with or which service provider. And what we can find out if we do portal scans that all of them <laughs> are associated with Desk Capital. Now you might be wondering, who's that company? Do they have anything to do with the bots? I assume they don't. I think they're just a hosting provider that doesn't care too much what's going on with their systems or they have too many systems running at once. I hope you learned something today. If you did, please click the subscribe button and make sure to hit the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Until next time. Subscribe now.